I'm the Director of Public Relations for Community Hospice. I'd like to welcome you to our Community Connections uh, webinar today on estate planning during COVID-19. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, our speaker today is Gina Ligeria with the law firm of Gina Ligeria, and we are very grateful for you uh, to take the time out of your day to join us and share this um, very um, useful information and resources. Um, I'm going to pass over the, uh, the um, I guess, mic or video to Gina at this time um, to get started and introduce uh, herself a little more. But I do want to invite all of our participants, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please do not hesitate to um, ask those questions in the chat field. We will be monitoring those questions and at the end of the presentation, we'll address them. Uh, Gina, thank you very much for joining us and I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Kristen. Well, welcome everyone. I appreciate you joining us here today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about estate planning in this COVID-19 era. So let me just, uh, get this slide going, there we go. So I like to talk about why most estate plans fail and what you can do about it. And here's um, the most important reason why I do what I do are my two girls, Rosa and Sophia, multi-sport athletes, and now both in college, I can hardly believe it, but I got started in the estate planning because my father was killed in an accident um, at the age of 42, and I was uh, just barely in my early 20s and left to take care of two younger siblings and his estate. And it was um, a very trying time for us. And we spent four and a half years in the probate court trying to settle up his affairs. And it was when, when it was all said and done, the court and attorneys and government got most of the money. So it was um, a really sad situation. And right then and there, I made it my mission to go to law school and make sure that never happened to another family again. So. I uh, do this so that I can protect my children and hopefully you want the same for your family. So these um, are perilous times in America and we think about what if something would happen, especially during this time in this era with everything going on, the pandemic, the wildfires, the hurricanes on the Eastern seaboard, the horrible air quality. So um, it's a time to really reflect and think about what would we do. And we, have nearly 16 million lawsuits filed um, every year and 750,000 people file for bankruptcy because a lot of it has to do with crushing medical bills. We unfortunately have one of the highest divorce rates in the world so families are splitting up and I can certainly say that during these trying times the stress that people are under are causing family dynamics and issues beyond belief that we're seeing. Nursing home and other long-term care expenses are, are just out of control and it costs $109,000 on average a year in the state of California to have someone in a nursing home. And we've heard the horror stories, we've seen the statistics, things going on with COVID. I know a lot of my clients are in nursing homes and their family haven't been able to see them for almost six months. It just finally is starting to open up. We've been having to get really creative on getting access to nursing homes so that we can care for our clients and make sure that they are protected. Estimated one in four bankruptcies is due to overwhelming medical bills. And I know that many of us face this, especially towards the end of life when you're in a hospice situation, uh, medical bills can certainly um, be a stressor and something that we all want to be mindful of. And then there are 44 million caregivers in America providing aid to family members and close friends. And I think that that number is actually growing exponentially um, because people are not returning to some nursing homes and situations are changing with critically ill people being cared for at home. So uh, that's what we're facing, but it's not all doom and gloom. Congratulations for being here today to learn more about what we can do in this coronavirus era and everything that's going on with our global health issues. Now we want to make sure that because of a store, poor state planning you don't end up in court after all and I'm going to talk quite a bit more about that on why a do-it-yourself option might not be the best option and, and how we can um, make sure that that doesn't happen to you ending up in court. So when I meet with clients, we talk really, the concerns break down into six major areas. 
the number one concern is they want to pass their hard-earned wealth without government or court interference. And that certainly would have been helpful in my own situation if my dad even had a plan in place to not have us be tied up in court for four and a half years. Number two is to avoid necess unnecessary taxes and fees. So you don't want the tax uh, government and attorneys to get all of your hard-earned wealth. That's something that you work for and you want it to leave to your loved ones. And then we don't want to go broke from nursing home. At $109,000 a year, our nest egg is not going to last very long. Clients also express that they want to protect their family from what we call predators and creditors. People who are just waiting to take advantage of them and offer pennies on the dollars for certain assets. And of course, family fights. Well, they want to avoid family fights, um, don't want people arguing over money or stuff. It should be really a time that people are grieving and brought closer together, but inevitably it can end up with um, long-term rifts and folks not speaking with each other. I saw a really nice article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday that talked quite a bit about reconciliation of long-held grudges or estrangements with siblings long after mom and dad are gone. So um, certainly something that concerns parents for when they're gone. And then how to pass not only the money and the stuff, but your wisdom, your values, uh, what you believe in, your faith, uh, your ethic, all that, making sure that that gets passed on to the next generation. So those are the six major concerns that many of our clients express on a regular basis. And some of those may speak to you or something that you're concerned about and want to learn a little bit more about today. So again, thank you for being here. Um, we want to give you some good education and some knowledge, but our focus is getting you into action. Once you have the knowledge, what are you going to do with that knowledge? And hopefully take some action on behalf of your estate and your loved ones to protect them in the future. The number one reason, of course, that people don't get a plan in place is procrastination. And we hear that time and time again. I don't have time, I'm busy, there's too much going on, I can't come to the office, uh, things of that nature. So we work really hard to eliminate a lot of those barriers and make sure that we're um, holding your hand and walking you through the process every step of the way so that we get a good solid plan in place for your family. And any law firm you work with should be able to do that for you. So another reason why people don't plan is just you don't know what you don't know. It's a lack of knowledge. There are continuous changes in the law and really traditional estate planning about money and property doesn't cover a lot of today's concerns. And many of today's concerns center around healthcare and healthcare decisions. So it's one thing to have a plan in place for when you're gone, but what about while you're alive and you're still here? If you become incapacitated for any way due to a diagnosis, um, maybe you do get coronavirus or cancer or something else, and you need to have a support system in place to make sure that you can navigate through that illness and hopefully recover, but if not, protect your family in the long run. So traditional estate planning, it really worships money and things. It's a very narrow view about avoiding costs and maximizing income and reducing taxes and fees, and then controlling the distributions, the who gets what. Um, that's all very important because you worked really hard for that money. But we also want to um, talk about what's valuable to you. Clients often tell us, well, they can have the money, I don't care, but I want them to just get along. And I want to know that they're going to work hard and appreciate what I am leaving for them. So we, it's about family and friends and health and relationships and then all those accrued experiences. You know, I often um, look back with some regret actually that at those family dinners over the years, we didn't put a tape recorder or a uh, a, now it's an iPhone or a, a cell phone on the table and record some of the stories that our grandparents and parents shared about their history growing up. What a precious gift that would have been. But those are the things that are important to people. 
It's a different sort of view. It's really holistic, if you will. So your core values, those deepest beliefs and values that are just um, part of your fabric and who you are. And of course, your wisdom, those experiences and lessons learned. And I always think to the, the adage of, well, when I was your age, I used to walk 10 miles in the snow. But those are important lessons. And hopefully, those won't be lost on the next generation. And of course, community, the contributions to causes that are near and dear to you and what you believe in. And that is so important right now because without being able to be in contact with each other, we have lost a little bit of our sense of community. We do have these online options, webinars and Zoom meetings and other type of video and interaction, but boy, clients tell us it's just not the same as being able to give somebody a nice hug. And so we want to make sure that whatever you have valued is passed on to your family. And then, of course, maximizing financial wealth. So it really is holistic, a broader view of how we do estate planning. So I told you from the outset. Guys, it looks like um, Gina has frozen and I'm not sure if she knows. So I'm gonna try to connect with her. Um, so please just bear with us for just a moment. These are some of the technical issues that happen um, with these online platforms. So we'll be back with you in just a moment. Again, our apologies. It looks like she has just logged off, so she's probably going to log back in. Um, so just a moment, please bear with us. Okay, and she's rejoining us. Just one moment. Hi, Gina. Welcome back. Can you hear us? Uh, yeah, now I can hear you. Sorry about that. That's okay. This is what happens sometimes with all, um, the technical issues, huh? Yeah, and it looks like they're doing work in our area, so. Oh, not a problem. So everybody's still with us, and oh, um, thank you all for your patience, and we'll yeah. turn it back over to Gina. Okay, can you, can you see the screen okay, Kristen? Okay, great, thank you. So I think I left off here why most estate plans fail, and talked about poor documentation and um, doing a trust in a pizza parlor, not a good idea. That a lot of trusts don't offer nursing home protection. Some of them don't have any funding mechanism. In other words, as you'll see, we create your trust, but we have to make sure that all of your properties inside the trust stays protected. And then if we want timely updates, perhaps remarriage protection in case uh, one of you passes away first and the other decides to remarry. And then as I mentioned, family legacies are not captured. So I'm gonna illustrate by use of a story and I'd like you to meet Mary and Bill Jones and today their estate's worth $700,000, primarily their house. Um, real estate is through the roof right now. So 
Um, that is, it's primarily their personal residence and they have some other investments. And you might ask, well, what if I'm not married? What if I'm single, never married, widowed, divorced, or I've been married more than once? And I would just simply say estate planning is for everybody. Everybody deserves a good estate plan, no matter what your circumstance in life. And because of your unique circumstances or whatever you have going on in your family life, we want to make sure to address that and have you be protected in all instances. So Mary and Bill have a couple of kids, John and Susan there. So this is the Jones family. And have you kept up with the Joneses? Well, a lot of people have. Um, you know, it's keeping up with the Joneses and acquiring wealth and acquiring experiences. And Bill and Mary have some planning options. So they have that $700,000 uh, with their house and their investments and IRAs and probably some retirement. And they can spend every last dollar. And that's a great option. I tell a lot of my clients, you don't owe your heirs anything. You can simply spend all your money and enjoy it. You could die intestate. And intestate just means you don't have a plan in place. So then what happens is the probate code for the state of California takes over. And that's exactly what happened in my dad's situation and why we were in court for so long. You can put everything in joint tenancy. So it's sort of like Survivor Island. The last person alive gets everything and that's okay between spouses, but then when you're both gone, what happens to your children? There are some simple wills, but as we'll see, wills still go to court. A judge still gets to decide and so the will has to be probated and it could take um, a long time to do that. I had mentioned bare bones living trust, the do it yourself or the basic kind that don't have funding, don't have nursing home protection, and don't have some, uh, some of the other unique facets that will protect your family. Or they could create a complete living trust plan and we'll see what that looks like. So everyone has the proverbial to-do list, exercise and plan those vacations and down at the bottom, create a will. Do some funeral planning maybe, get some ducks in a row. And lo and behold, Bill has a stroke and Mary is left to care for him. And that can be a very expensive and difficult proposition. So what are the ways to care for someone? How do we pay for long-term care at $109,000 a year? Well, you could do in-home care and many families are doing that, but it's very difficult for the family members. And we see a lot of caregiver burnout for the person who is the primary caregiver. There are some limited adult daycare, but unfortunately right now those are closed due to COVID. I have seen some of those reopening, but uh, very strict protocols in place. There's assisted living available and many nice new facilities here in the Central Valley. And then of course, nursing home care is an option if somebody needs a skilled nursing type of situation, just a higher level of care. But there's only five ways to pay for that. And we'll take a look at um, some of those. You can use your money until you're totally broke. And a lot of families do that. They burn through all of their life savings paying for a nursing home. You could buy long-term care insurance and hope that you get coverage. Uh, it gets prohibitively expensive after the age of 55. So unless you already have a policy in place that's not charging you astronomical premiums, this may or may not be an option for you. And I would suggest that you talk with an insurance um, professional or a financial advisor and some of the options. There's Medicare. This is the government program for general medical expenses. And they do co cover some nursing home care, but it's up to 100 days only. So really the purpose of Medicare is to provide for your general health and well-being, and then get you up on your feet. So Medicare is not gonna pay to have you stay in a nursing home on a long-term basis. It's just the 100 days while you're rehabilitating and making progress. And that's really a shock to some people because they say, oh, I have Medicare, I'm covered. And I'd have to say, no, actually you're not. It's only 100 days. And then there's the state program. This is Medi-Cal. Nationwide, it's known as Medicaid. And this is a program that pays for nursing home care. But unfortunately, you have to spend down all your assets. So you essentially have to be broke in order to qualify. 
and it can be very complicated on how to get there. Now, one of the things I like to mention though, is you get to keep your home as long as it's protected in a living trust and stays out of probate court. And that's a fairly new law with, I would say within the last three years or so that went into effect. So people often say, oh no, I can't go on Medi-Cal because they'll take my home. Well, we do have tools now to protect your home. So if that's your situation, that's definitely something um, to talk about. And if you're a veteran, a dishonorably discharged veteran, there are certain aid and attendance benefits that you might qualify for. So that could also be your situation. So those are the five ways really to pay for long-term care. And unfortunately, most of my families end up using their own money before they come to see me. And we wanna do some planning on the front end to prevent that very sad outcome on the back end. So now that Bill is disabled, how will his affairs be handled? Because Mary and Bill didn't get around to do their planning. For the most part, a spouse can do many things, but in some situations, or if there is no spouse, somebody's gonna have to go to court and be appointed as a conservator or the guardian of that person. And that's what we call a living probate. So that's a process of going to court, naming somebody to be in charge of that person's affairs, and then having all that be supervised by the court. And that happens to families quite often, especially when there's no surviving spouse to be able to do some of those things and dealing with assets and IRS and retirement and other things and providing medical care. So again, that's a living probate and another trip to the courthouse, unfortunately. So we wanna avoid that because it is humiliating, it's very time consuming and it's open to the public. Anybody can go down to the court and take a look at your file and it can be quite expensive and it's ongoing. It just doesn't end. There are periodic, usually annual reports to the court, sometimes more often about how that conservatorship is going. And then unfortunately, Bill passes away. So now Mary's left widowed. And what do we have? Because they didn't have a plan in place. Well, unless they had joint tenancy, leaving everything to the survivor, and that doesn't happen sometimes, we have to go to court. And that's what we call now the death probate. And court is just basically a place where disputes are resolved, creditors are paid, and then we do an inventory and appraisal of all the assets, change title to the assets, and then distribute it to the survivors. And again, if you die without a plan in place, all that's laid out in the probate code. So that's called dying intestate. And it may end up going to people that you don't even want it to go to. For instance, if you die without a spouse and without children, then they first look to your parents if they're still living. And if your parents aren't living, then it goes to your siblings. And this can be shocking for some people because they say, wait a minute, I don't want my no good brother to get my stuff. I work too hard for it and I don't even like him. So it's very important to have a plan in place to address those unique situations. Here's why you should avoid probate. And I talked a lot about my situation already, but it can be very expensive. There are court fees, publication fees for the newspaper, attorney and executor fees. And attorney and executor fees are roughly 4% of the gross value of assets. It's very time consuming. It's open to the public. Again, court records are open to the public. And if you have property in more than one state, maybe a condo in Florida or a piece of farmland in Missouri, you have to do a probate in California and then a probate in that state as well. So that can become really difficult coordinating all that. And of course, very expensive. I had mentioned that attorney and executor fees are roughly 4% of gross value of assets. So here's just a little chart that demonstrates that and outlines what a fee on a um, $750,000 estate would be. So you remember I mentioned that Bill and Mary had roughly $700,000. So they're looking at just shy of $18,000 in probate fees, plus the court fees, another $1,500 to $2,000. So almost a $20,000 probate just on the death of Bill. Very sad indeed, and this could have been completely avoided through good estate planning. Now, people often ask about taxes, and right now 
we um, don't have a federal estate tax except for estates above, it says 5.4 million, but there's a little temporary um, doubling of that right now. That expires fairly soon. And right now it's $11 million. So if your estate is under $11 million, there are no federal estate tax. And of course we're coming up in an election year. So this could change this next year. And we'll just wait to see what Congress and um, whatever president is in office decide to do with that. But right now there are no federal estate taxes unless your estate is up over those thresholds. California currently doesn't have any state death taxes. So it's one of the few taxes we don't have. We have one of the highest income taxes and, and gas taxes in the world and sales taxes, but we don't actually do death taxes yet. So, um, but who knows, that could change at any time if the California state legislature and the governor needs to balance a budget. So we um, don't have to worry about that right now in California, but there really are some worries after Bill dies. What happens if Mary decides to remarry? What's gonna happen with lawsuits and creditors? What if Bill left some really outstanding debt? What's Mary gonna do then? She's gonna have to use all of their nest egg to pay all that off. And then of course, what about nursing home expenses? What if something happens to Mary? Mary currently has the whole estate and on average women outlive men by a, about 14 years. That's not a rule of thumb. So men don't worry, um, you're not gonna necessarily uh, go first, but I would say on average, women do outlive men by about 14 years. So what happens to Mary? Well, she lives 10 more years actually, and her money grows, her estate grows, and she meets Ralph. Ralph was a longtime neighbor. They started talking in the yard over the fence while out pruning the rose bushes and pretty soon they're having coffee, meeting for lunch dates. And then eventually Ralph and Mary decide to get married. And that can be a concern, especially for, remember we started out with John and Susan keeping up with the Joneses. So a well-drafted estate plan can keep your wealth in your family. So it could block a transfer to Ralph. He couldn't come and swoop in and take Mary for all her money and leave the family without anything. Happens all the time. Somebody remarries, new spouse lives in the home. It's the long-term family home, sometimes for 50 years even. And then when um, mom or dad die, the step spouse, the step parent gets at home and that family legacy is just gone, just like that. So in good planning, we can require prenuptial and have some remarriage protection in there to prevent that from happening. Now, unfortunately, Mary gets Alzheimer's. So this poor family, Bill had a stroke, he passed away. And now Mary, it's 10 years later, she develops Alzheimer's. And this is very common, especially as people age and especially the situations we're in right now with being shut in and not having a lot of brain stimulation. We're seeing a big prevalence of these types of cases. And John and Susan can't care for her at home, so she's going to be placed in a nursing home. And it's said that about half of the elderly end up in nursing home before death, even if it's just for a short period of time. But she's not able to handle her affairs. So Mary lives, drains out the bank account for her long-term care and passes away. And there we go, they still haven't done any planning. So we're doing probate again. So we end up back in probate court one more time with all that time and expense that I told you about before. And I forgot to mention that on average here in Stanislaus County where I'm located, it's taking about 12 to 14 months to do a probate. I also do probates in other counties that surround us, Calaveras, Merced, San Joaquin. San Joaquin, unfortunately, is up to about 16 to 18 months, and that's if everything goes perfectly every step of the way. So something else that Bill and Mary were concerned about but never did anything about is financial maturity. And are their children ready to receive a lump sum distribution that could be several hundred thousand dollars, perhaps? Um, that is one of the biggest concerns. Can my kids handle that and will they blow it all? And then they also worry about that daughter-in-law or that son-in-law. What if my child gets a divorce? What's going to happen to the money that I've left them? 
And will they be taken advantage of by opportunists and the latest uh, investment opportunity, the, the tech dot bomb or something? You know, all their hard earned money goes out the window with some poor investment. And kids also can get in trouble with creditors and lawsuits. So those really are the things that keep parents up at night. So that's every parent's nightmare. Susan's married to Jason, her lazy, no good husband, and perhaps Susan's funds are gonna be co-mingled. And then if they get a divorce, well, guess what? Jason gets half of everything. So I tell my clients, counsel your, ch your children. If they ever get an inheritance, that is considered their separate property. They do not have to share that with their spouse. They can put it in a bank account that is in their name alone, of course, with appropriate beneficiary designation so they don't end up with a probate estate down the road. But we want to protect the next generation as well. And of course, John, John, he's just a walking liability case. Uh, fast Corvette, lawsuit liability, could take someone out in a car accident. Maybe he owes back taxes. Maybe he owes child support for a child he's never had a part in their life of. So lots of issues can happen with your children and the, your wealth going to the next generation. So I've given you sort of the doom and gloom, the worst case scenarios and what can happen to a family. Um, and these things actually do happen. They happen all the time. So the question comes up, is there a better, better alternative? And absolutely, we want to make sure that your family is protected. So we're going to switch gears and talk a little bit about a living trust. A living trust and how does it work and how does it protect your family? So we're going to hit that big green button and give John, uh, Bill and Mary a big do-over. We're going to let them go on those vacations, plan plan retirement exercise, and they're going to create their living trust and their estate plan and do funeral arrangements and have all of those ducks in a row. So we want to avoid, though, in our planning, as I mentioned, those fast food documents, bare bones, DIY that only address probate. They're really inadequate because you might have some unique circumstances. I can guarantee that many of them do not provide nursing home protection and they do not protect against John and Susan and all the things that could come up in their lives, like a spouse and a divorce and creditors and lawsuits. So really fill in the blank kind of things. Do not protect families from real world concerns. We like to take a look at what we call legacy planning. So leaving your legacy. Not only do we want to pr protect all that financial wealth, your IRAs and pensions and 401ks in your house, but we want to protect those non-financial assets, your stories, your legacy, your value, and what's important to you through that living trust. So the magic really of a living trust is how do you hold title to those assets? And right now I'm betting if you went and looked at your property deed and some of your bank accounts, if you are married, it probably says husband and wife as joint tenants, or maybe you have a child on there or another person, or maybe if that's not your circumstance, you don't have anybody else on your account, but you have a beneficiary designation. And if that beneficiary is a minor, it's gonna be really difficult for that minor to claim that money until they turn 18 or until somebody goes to court to establish guardianship for them to make sure that they can claim that money on their behalf. But the magic again of a trust is how you hold title. So we create your trust and we title everything in the name of the trust. So instead of having separate property is just Mary or separate property is just Bill or husband and wife as joint tenants or joint account holders, everything goes into the trust. So instead of Bill and Mary joint tenants, it's now Bill and Mary trustees of the Jones Family Trust. And the same thing would be for you. Your name, trustee of the name of your trust. It's really that simple. So all you really need to remember is that when you create a trust, you are in complete control. You create and put your assets in the trust. So that is called the trust door. The creator is the trust door. Then you also are the trustee while you're alive. You manage and sell and spend assets, 
But when you're gone, you have a backup trustee. Now they can't spend those assets on themselves because all those assets when you're gone are for your beneficiaries. But as long as you're alive and you're the trustee, you are also the beneficiary and it's still all yours. It's just another way to hold title. So you have total control. You're not giving up anything. You are the trustor, a trustee, and you're the beneficiary. It all belongs to you. So it's business as usual. You can buy, you can sell, you can refinance your house at these fantastic interest rates that are going right on right now. You can um, open new accounts, you can buy a timeshare, you can sell a timeshare, buy a new car, whatever you want to do. Everything is in your trust and it can be amended, revoked at any time by you. There's no new income tax forms to fill out and there's no change in your property tax bill. So no taxes based on any of that. As it says, business as usual, just carry on. So the question then is, well, why should I create the trust in the first place? And it really boils down to, it's your standby device. It's your insurance. It is your protection. If you be become disabled and when you pass away, all the assets in that living trust pass to your loved ones or your beneficiaries that you designate in advance without the cost of going to probate. So no probate code, uh, court, excuse me, no probate court involved, no judge, no long proceedings of a year plus plus, and not all the expense. So it's a way to protect your family. So will Bill's estate go into probate? Well, no, because those assets are already titled in the name of the trust. So it has no impact on Bill's death. And when Ralph comes along, what do we do about Ralph this time? Is he going to bleed Mary dry and end up with the legacy family home? Well, no. We have blocking language in there, remarriage protection, and we could even require a prenuptial agreement. We can have Ralph sign off and say, I have no rights to Mary's trust whatsoever. All that can take place inside your living trust. And then we protect Mary eventually from nursing home expenses and also protect the family from liability. So if Mary does need that nursing home care at $109,000 a year, there may be ways to transfer those assets and protect the home using some Medi-Cal protection strategies. So we don't have to go through any expensive court proceedings, everything is set up, and Susan, probably not John, but Susan would already have the authority to manage Mary's affairs when she does get Alzheimer's. So the legal fees, um, no legal fees to make sure that Mary's taken care of, but we do have that nursing home stay. And if she's in there for 18 months, that's almost $200,000. When she passes away, then it has still go through death probate unless she has a living trust in, in place. So a living trust so far has protected the family when Bill has uh, become disabled and died, Mary meets Ralph, Mary might have a lawsuit or John might have a lawsuit, Mary gets Alzheimer's, and then Mary has nursing home costs, we're still protected, and then no death probate when Mary dies. Don't have any death taxes because their estate wasn't um, big enough to do that. But we also have an opportunity to pass on family values and then protect Susan from Jason and her divorce proceedings and perhaps John and his lawsuits or whatever situation is going on in his nefarious world. So parents really do worry about those things and here's why they worry about those things. Sometimes assets should just be left in trust. There are ways that if after Mary's gone, we can still hold assets in trust and protect John and Susan from themselves or their spouses or their creditors. So a living trust can actually save your family long after you're gone. So Susan can have divorce protection and Jason would get nothing. And John could have lawsuit protection and an independent trustee would have restrictions on what he could get. And this is attractive to some of our parents, especially if they have a child with a substance abuse problem, they can hand out a little bit of money at a time so they don't end up blowing it all on another fancy car or a vacation to uh, the Caribbean or something like that. So a lot of protection built in place for the family. 
And one very important piece of a protection that we talk about um, for families is if you have a child or a grandchild with special needs. So sometimes we have a child that has some disabilities and they are on public assistance benefits. They get government benefits like their Medi-Cal and like Social Security. And if they were to inherit a large sum of money, they could lose all those benefits. That's their safety net, especially important for those that are facing mental illness, which is very prevalent in our society today. So without those public benefits, they would be absolutely lost. Their safety net is gone. So what we do is we keep money in what's called a family special needs trust. And there would be a trustee named by you to provide any additional funds that are needed for that disabled child for their special or supplemental needs. So they would not lose out on their public assistance benefits that become so important for them. This is a huge relief to families when they find out there's a way to protect that. So that is comprehensive estate planning. Um, in a nutshell, a lot of different types of documents, but it really all works together. There's a living trust, which offers creditor protection, divorce protection, special needs provisions that we just talked about. We also do something called a pour over will. And you might think, well, wait a minute, Jeannie, you told me your will still goes to court and that's bad. This is a very special kind of will. Um, it does exactly what the name says, pour over. So if we forget or you forget or something happens to put an asset into the trust, we can use that will to pour it back over into the trust. So it's a pour over will, very important uh, document that works hand in hand with the trust. There's also the property agreement in California, we're a community property state. So if you're married, everything you own and bring to the marriage, um, uh, acquire during marriage, is part of your community. So we have an agreement that says that you own that together, unless of course you've inherited something, then that's your separate property. And we can make arrangements to keep that separate, but available for your care and for your family on your passing. Then we have a property power of attorney. So a power of attorney document serves you while you're alive. And in this COVID-19 era, very important document to have. If you're incapacitated for any reason, um, this names an agent, someone who can do your banking, pay your bills, um, pay your mortgage for you, file your income taxes, talk to the cable company of all things, and also deal with your cell phone and any other business. I think of it as appointing an agent. Um, you know, movie stars, celebrities, and sports figures, they all have agents. So you should have an agent too, but your agent only jumps into action if you are not able to handle your own affairs. And as parents age, it's really important to have these in place because time and time again, I get these very sad phone calls about how mom was scammed into sending money to some mysterious account because they got a phone call from someone who was pretending to be a grandchild and said, oh, grandma, I'm in jail and I need the bail money. And grandma sends the money thinking that she's taking care of her grandchild. And then she gets scammed out of several thousand dollars. It's sad indeed. And so sometimes when our parents start to slip a little bit and need some support, it would be really important for the caregiver to have a power of attorney to be able to assist them in that manner. And then of course we do healthcare documents, healthcare power of attorney and the HIPAA form. Healthcare power of attorney is naming an agent, someone to advocate for you on your behalf and talk about what your healthcare wishes are. So it's not someone who pulls a plug or does something like that. That scares a lot of parents because they don't think that their child would have the ability to do that. All we ask your agent, your healthcare agent to do is to sure to be your voice and to tell your doctors and nurses and healthcare team exactly what you want to have happen, which we fully document in those healthcare documents. So we do the advanced directive as well. And the advanced directive outlines what those wishes are. Do you want to be on life support? 
Do you want to be resuscitated? If you have a, um, a chronic health condition and it's terminal and you're not going to get any better, do you have a pulsed form in place? And I know the good folks here at hospice work with that all the time as they're caring for people at their end of life um, on this journey. So we want to make sure that that entire safety net of healthcare documents are in place for you. And of course, HIPAA. HIPAA is everywhere. You can't have somebody's private health information or talk to a doctor or a health team member without having authorization in place. And again, that's very important for somebody caring for a loved one because they need to be able to coordinate that care. And your doctors in the hospital and the lab and everybody will wanna have that HIPAA authorization on file so that they know that they can talk to you and can provide you that information to care for your loved one. So what's the most important part of planning? Well, we believe it's making sure that's what is most important to you is reflected and covered in that plan. It shouldn't be some fill in the blank document that doesn't capture your lifetime of experiences. We want to make sure, and let me explain a little further, that you don't have a canned bare bones estate plan. You want a plan that's designed for your family. And the attorney has to create the plan based on what your wishes are, not what they think is best. Of course, they provide you with the professional advice to make sure that you're fully protected. But this plan has to work for your family for generations. And those fill in the blank forms don't do it. I can honestly say that I spend probably more time in court with those fill in the blank forms then we could have done a really good plan on the front end. So that really saddens me because people think they're doing good planning and really they're not. They've done that bare bones job and it ends up costing the family time and expense in court anyhow. So the one necessary ingredient that a lot of those bare bones plans don't have is called funding. Nobody took the time to make sure that all the assets were put into the trust. It has to have everything titled in the name of the trust. So we would retitle your house again from Bill and Mary Jones, husband and wife joint tenants to Bill and Mary Jones, trustees of the Jones Family Trust. Same thing would be true of your assets, your bank accounts. Uh, sometimes we do life insurance policies depending upon the circumstances. I was not so much because we want those to be left to the spouse so they get the maximum tax advantage um, of that. So, but there are some other planning tools around IRAs and um, other types of investments like certificates of deposit should go in your trust as well. Um, as well as family heirlooms, we make provisions inside of your trust for all those things that are really important to you and that you think people might fight over. A lot of times it's not just about the money, it's about grandpa's pocket watch or grandma's turkey platter of all things. So we want to make sure that trust works and it has all the detail that you need for your family, because if it's just this beautiful binder with a lot of hollow language, it's really worthless. It is only as good as the ink that is in there and can work for your family in your unique situation. If you're working with a professional, here's what you need to do. You need to ask about a living trust. Does it have incapacity protection? Am I protected if I become disabled for whatever reason, whether that's physically or mentally, um, and for whatever period of time, short term, uh, because I uh, have COVID-19, I'm on a ventilator in a hospital, or long term, because I'm starting to get early onset uh, dementia of some type. We also want to make sure that it has all the protection against probate and taxes because we just don't know what's going to happen with taxes in the future. That could change at any time. So you want to have a trust that has language in there that has flexible protection to keep up with the tax laws and the changes that happen. Of course, I talked about Ralph and having that remarriage protection in place, making sure that nothing happens should uh, your uh, remarry so your surviving spouse remarry and protect against losing everything to the step parent and not have anything left for your children and grandchildren and then finally creditor protection lawsuit protection those types of things making sure that you have a safety net in place 
if your kids or somebody are making bad choices, or if you have that special needs situation. That could be another way that you need to protect someone. So what's important to you? And we ask that time and time again. And as I mentioned, people talked about their core values, their wisdom, their life experiences. So um, I'm not gonna talk so much about making an appointment because I'm not here to sell you anything. Um, I'm just here to provide you free education and make sure that you are armed with knowledge and information so that you can have a good plan in place. But if you were so inclined, I just want you to know that in my practice, we do offer a free consultation and you are welcome to call my office anytime and I'm happy to sit down and chat with you about that. But today is really about providing you education and information and learning more about this very important topic so that your family stays protected. And I would just say, now's the time to act because as Pablo Picasso said, only put off until tomorrow what you are willing to die having left undone. So with that, um, this is a great time to have questions, Krish or Kristen, if you wanna jump on and see if there's anything, any questions that popped up in chat. Tina, thank you so much. This has been so, um, just a wonderful resource and uh, working for hospice, um, we do see and know the value of uh, estate planning and how important it is. So with that, there are a few questions. Um, the first one is, uh, what is the right age to start thinking about estate planning? Well, you might be surprised to know that it's at any age, but I'll share with you um, at my own personal story. Um, once your adult child turns 18, and I say adult, young adult, and I have uh, two that are 18, one 18 and 20 now, but they have to have estate planning documents in place. And you may say, what? Kids don't own anything. But estate planning is very comprehensive. As I mentioned, it's powers of attorney. It's healthcare power of attorney. And it's the HIPAA form. And so for college-bound students, what we like to do is make sure that those documents are in place because once someone's 18, mom and dad really don't have a say anymore. So they need to have an agent in place to be able to make healthcare decisions for them and any financial matters that need to be taken care of. So it starts there, but I would say a really good milestone or benchmark is if you own real property because one of the big goals of estate planning is to make sure that your estate stays out of probate. And the biggest asset, the biggest investment that we all have is usually our home, multi hundreds, thousands of dollars, and we wanna keep that out of probate court. So I do a lot of work of, with young families and sometimes it's a sacrifice for them because they're raising you know, kids and they don't have the time and sometimes not the money to start investing in estate planning, but it really is important to do it um, very soon, very early. And if you are a little bit older now, no time like the present to get started to protect your family. I have clients, as I said, from 18 all the way up to my oldest client came to see me at 98 and he goes, oh, I guess it's about time I do something about this and by golly, <laughs> Yes, it was. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Okay, the next question is, um, Gina, what happens if, God forbid, my wife and I are in a car accident and my immediate family, um, like parents and siblings, are living abroad and not U.S. citizens? What happens to my children in that scenario? Um, so your children, at least in the short term, are going to be put into... Um, uh, foster care. They're going to be um, taken in by a social worker. The social workers will work diligently to try to find a suitable guardian, but um, sometimes your family can't get here uh, it quickly. And with a lot of what's going on with COVID right now, you know, some of uh, the flights are canceled and people aren't allowed in and out of country. So um, they would be in foster care for a period of time. And then at some point, um, there would be a court hearing to file for guardianship and name guardians of the children and get that taken care of. So that's another critical piece of estate planning. Uh, in the will, the will is the place where we do this, we can name guardians for your children. And it's a place where we say, okay, 
I want my brother who maybe resides in India to come to the US and become their guardian and take over for us. And um, we could lay out all those wishes and set up the plan in a way that your brother would have access to the resources in order to care for your children. But yeah, unfortunately, if you haven't done anything, your kids are gonna go with a social worker and end up in a stranger's home for a period of time until it gets resolved. Mm, thank you for that information. Um, and then if somebody has a trust in place um, and needs to make changes to that trust, how, how difficult is that process? Um, it's not difficult at all because really you own your trust documents. You should actually have possession of them. I know that there are a lot of attorneys that retain your estate planning documents because um, they hope that you will come back to their firm or your family will come back to their firm when you're gone and they may or may not have a probate situation there. But I, I like to own my stuff and it's my information. So um, I give all of my clients their estate planning documents. Uh, if you already have a plan in place and want it reviewed, I'm happy to assist with that. And we just go through and take a look and see what's changed and what needs to be updated and then brings everything up to the current law. So um, it's not too hard to amend, update, a change of plan at all. Wonderful. Okay, um, so I think that was all the questions that I see here. I'll give um, just another moment if somebody has a question and um, if they'd like to, if they can raise their hand at the bottom or enter it into the chat field. Um, Gina, at this time, we'd just like to really thank you for participating in our Community Connections webinar. Um, I know this is different for everybody, um, but we're glad we're able to continue to provide these resources in a creative way for our community. Um, if you need uh, Gina's assistance, um, we encourage you to reach out to her. Uh, her phone number is 209-416-0353 or you could um, visit their website at LagariaLaw.com. And um, we will also be providing a uh, email to all the participants today um, with some information and we'll make sure to include your information in that email as well. So I don't see any other questions at this time. So oh, uh, I, saw, I saw one pop up. So um, uh, there was a question about what about pets? And oh, I, I wanted to, yeah. I see that. Oh, it's in the q and I'm sorry. Yeah, wrong. no problem. Yes, um, what about pets? Yeah, what about pets? So that's a great question because, you know, some of us have fur babies and, and others, and we want to provide for them, and we do that. We put pet provisions in our trust at your request. So you can allocate a sum of money for a caretaker to take over your pet and care for them um, for the rest of their natural life. And I actually have one family who um, lives up in the foothill area and they have livestock and um, all kind, a big menagerie. And they created a trust that has their caretaker actually moving into their home and living there and taking care of their, they like to call it the zoo and um, caring for them. And then that caretaker is gonna find a successor. So really it's set up for the pets for life. Um, which is exactly what that family wanted. So yes, we can do something as elaborate as like Leona Helmsley left her whole estate to her pet, uh, but usually just for the care it through their natural life is good. Wonderful, what a great question. Yeah. Are there any other questions at this time? I don't, I don't see anything, anything else. Well, Gina, right. thank you again for taking the time. Oh, um, my pleasure. Thank you like all to, for being here today. Absolutely. And we'd like to thank our participants that joined us today. Um, our next topic for Community Connections is in October. We'll also send you that link. And it is all about um, planning for Medicare open enrollment. So we are meeting the day before Medicare open enrollment. So you'll have the most up-to-date information from our high cap department. So with that, we... Uh, Wish you all um, a wonderful day and hope that you stay well. And uh, remember to wear a mask when you're out in the community. Definitely. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.